and welcome back. Uh, hopefully the past two sessions have been really good. For me, the way I feel is like this, it's awesome, right? So, and Jonathan's laughing in the background. Uh, a number of you may have been asking as to what kind of shirt I'm wearing. I'm just gonna go up a little bit here, I'm gonna see. So, I build apps and games for Windows Phone. So if you're interested in something like that, maybe we might be able to have a shirt for you if you build a couple apps. So um, definitely take a look at that. So over the past two sessions uh, earlier today, we, we talked a little bit about um, you know, an overview of Windows Phone development uh, from a native component, right? So what do you do to build native applications for Windows Phone? What do you do to take advantage of the features of Windows Phone? Things like you know, sensors, lock screen, all those types of things. And then we got into HTML5 and uh, a primer on HTML5. And hopefully you enjoyed some of those demos as well. I enjoy doing those demos because it really brings to life some of the things that you can do with HTML5 just on the browser. And truly, we're seeing a situation where HTML5 is becoming the way of the future to build these rich, immersive experiences on the web, but also as we're seeing uh, on the platform, the native platform as well. So Windows 8, as you're probably aware, you can build native applications in, uh, in, in HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. Windows Phone is slightly different um, than Windows 8 in that respect, and that's kind of a misconception that I have to deal with when I talk to developers quite a bit, is you can't build a native HTML application on Windows Phone, at least not yet. We haven't provided any guidance as to when that will be available or if we are bringing it available. So uh, just don't uh, bother asking any questions in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the rolling uh, chat window there because uh, we can't answer that at this point. But what you can do is build some really, really immersive and rich experiences as a hybrid application. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, uh, or at least in this specific uh, session around IE 10, Windows Phone, and building the whole idea of uh, awesome hybrid apps. So um, let's just get to it. So why would you build a hybrid HTML5 native application on Windows Phone? So you can build a native application on Windows Phone with C Sharp, VB, even C++ now, uh, XAML as well, and things like that, or Direct3D if you're building a game, for example. So that's a lot of options right there. Um, and the question that a lot of people ask themselves is, okay, well, we have so many options here. What, what's the point in having another option, you know, like HTML5? Especially if it's, you know, a hybrid application and there's not a whole lot of, you know, uh, native stuff that you can do uh, with that, that uh, application. Well, there's a lot of good reasons as to why you might want to do that. And surprisingly enough, if you're not familiar with the, our model for HTML5 on Windows Phone, there's a lot of things that you can immerse your HTML experience with the native application side as well. There's a lot of ways to communicate between the HTML and the native side uh, and vice versa. And uh, there's lots that we've actually added to the platform so that you can make the most rich, the most immersive experience possible that really doesn't even feel like a hybrid application. It actually feels more like, um, like, like a, a truly native application, including the way it looks. So we're going to talk a little bit about that a little later as well. So let's talk about some of the things that you might want to do, uh, why you might want to actually build HTML5 experiences on Windows Phone. So as you can see, the first bullet point, it's all about reuse in a lot of ways. Well, that is good, right? You know, like you can, if you're a web developer, this is a great way to sort of introduce yourself to Windows Phone development in of itself. Because, you know, you can build web pages with CSS, JavaScript, and of course, hypertext uh, to, to make that happen. You can host that on you know, the web, or you can host it locally. Uh, all those things are available to you. And in fact, if you have existing assets, say, for example, you built a hybrid application in PhoneGap, for example, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for iOS, or for Android, or for BlackBerry, for that matter, you can make use of uh, that, those assets as well. Uh, within your Windows Phone application because it's a web page and really a hybrid application is a native wrapper around uh, web control and we'll get into the details around that a little bit later. Um, also, reducing development costs. That's one of the other things that you can do uh, to, uh, to make use of it. So this is talking about reusing the assets. So you build once for the web type of thing and then you can reuse that across multiple platforms, not just Windows Phone. Uh, you can obviously you know, use iOS, you can use Android, all those types of things. Now, the one thing that I would caution, and we'll talk a little bit about this as well going forward, is it's all well and good to say that you can reuse the assets uh, that you have currently within your web properties or your web assets and uh, build out a great native experience or hybrid experience with native uh, support. 
But one of the things that I find people trip up on is, you know, you may target iOS or Android first, for example, which is totally understandable. I mean, they have very large market share. We have not as big market share, but we are growing. But one of the, 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 the things that I've found developers actually have a problem with is that they say, okay, well, I can build these assets in HTML, which means that I can use them anywhere uh, because, you know, it's HTML and all that kind of stuff. But they don't actually think about the experiential side. And that's really, really important because in order to have a great experience on your phone application, to have users want to come back to it, you want to make sure that that application looks and feels just like a native application for that platform. So the last thing you want is to have an iOS look and feel on a Windows phone app. Likewise, you probably would not want you know, a modern UI sort of look and feel on, uh, on an iOS app because of the fact that they just don't fit. So that's something you have to keep in mind. There's a lot to do with uh, the CSS around making it, skinning it properly for the various different platforms. So just keep that in mind. And then third, um, you can use native components within your, uh, within your hybrid application to augment what the functionality is on your web page. That's the third bullet point that we're talking about here. So the ability to communicate between your native code and the HTML code, meaning the JavaScript in this case, you know, so that you can have that back and forth communication so that the native application always knows what, for lack of a better term, what state your web page is in and things like that. And then vice versa, you can actually send information via JavaScript from your web page to the native application, and then you can sort of uh, do some functionality or have some functionality associated with that. And in fact, uh, near the end of this uh, presentation, we'll have a couple demos that can show a bunch of these things. So hopefully that'll, uh, that'll keep you interested as we go forward. And let's talk about momentum. Uh, so I talked a little bit about the fact that uh, Windows Phone, you know, it does have smaller market share than our comp competitors. I don't think that's any surprise to anybody. Um, but frankly, we do have momentum. So let's take a look. Um, One billion mobile devices and modern browsers in 2013. So this is aggregate total, right? So this isn't just about Windows Phone. This is overall. And we're finding that, you know, Mobile computing is absolutely, A, here to stay, and B, it's also something that people need to start paying attention to if they want to bring their experience to a wider audience. In fact, there's a lot of you know, uh, people out there that may not even have a PC at home, but they do have a cell phone, and not just a cell phone, but a smartphone. So we're finding that you know, mobile devices in general are becoming more prevalent than you would find on, um, uh, on, on desktop PCs or laptops and things like that as well. So it's a very, very important point to keep in mind because of the fact that we're ha having to modify or at least adjust the way we look at the web and how we look at applications because of the fact that mobile devices are taking over in a lot of ways. So that's the first point. We also have 2 million web developers in 2013. That's quite a few uh, web developers that, that, that focus specifically on web. Now. Web developers typically, as you might imagine, focus on browser-based experiences for the most part. Um, we have a, they have a very specific skill set around building great experiences in browsers. And one of the great things about hybrid applications is you're still building and targeting towards a browser. So as a web developer, you can make use of the skill sets that you already have today and move forward uh, building these great experiences on mobile applications, not just Windows Phone. And Almost 80% of you know mobile developers are exploring HTML5 for various different reasons, right? Again, talking about the previous slide that we had around reusing assets that you might have, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single platform that you have and everything else like that. But frankly, you just need to make sure that you have the right strategy in place if you're going to do that, because there are drawbacks as well as plot positives with building HTML5 experiences, uh, hybrid experiences uh, for mobile platforms. So you just have to be aware of that. But at the same time, as a mobile developer, understanding HTML5, probably a good idea because of the fact that you know we're having these experiences. HTML5 so, so powerful, as you probably saw in the previous session around some of the demos that I did. And those were very simple demos. The ability to create these rich experiences with not a whole lot of markup and not a whole lot of JavaScript. So it's very, very possible that this might be a model going forward for you as well. And another one here is like uh, 80%, so 8 out of 10, 4 out of 5. Mobile apps will be using HTML5 by 2015. Um, 
it's just showing the fact that there's a lot of momentum there and uh, the fact that we really should start paying attention to it. So what is a mobile application uh, or that uses HTML5 on Windows Phone? Well, you know, we talked or I alluded to this a little bit in the past a uh, few minutes, but basically you have a native wrapper, so you have code that is native like C Sharp or VB and XAML, for example, or even C++ if you wanted to technically. And in that XAML, you've defined a web control, uh, which is basically a browser uh, embedded into the XAML uh, that your web page will actually exist in. And really, that's the, the crux of what we're talking about here. So it's not a, a native integration of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It's actually more of a case of um, building some great experiences that, have on, that you have on a web page and then doing communication back and forth between the native wrapper and the JavaScript and vice versa. So that's really what it is. Oop, went the wrong way there. So one of the things that Microsoft has done is we've added a new project template into, uh, into Visual Studio 2012 Express for Windows Phone. Or if you have the paid SKUs like uh, Professional, Premium, or, or Ultimate of Visual Studio 2012, you can download the SDK and it's automatically included into, uh, into the project templates that are associated with that as well. So either way, uh, you get the project template to build great HTML experiences. And if you're familiar with PhoneGap, this will be very familiar to you as well. So you can build officially, there is official support in Windows Phone 8 for PhoneGap. So we've worked with Adobe to make sure that the PhoneGap SDK has been updated for Windows Phone 8. Likewise, for Windows Phone 7.5 and 7.8, it is supported as well. Uh, just a different template for that. But the bottom line here is um, we've also included our own template for this so that you can actually make use of the, um, uh, the, the template that we have without having to download phone gap if that's the way you want to go. Either one is great. Uh, I'm, I'm very sure that a lot of people that are on phone gap today are extremely happy. It's a great way to, to build hybrid applications. Likewise, if you're just starting out and you want to use our template, it's very rich, very, uh, it's got feature parity in a lot of ways to, to phone gap in, in, in a lot of ways, so you don't have to worry about downloading the SDK. It's really up to you. For the rest of this, uh, this presentation, though, and the demos that I'm going to show you, it is going to be our own HTML5 app template uh, that we're going to be uh, showing as far as the demos are concerned. So just keep, keep that in mind. So Internet Explorer 10 is our most recent version of IE. Um, if you have not seen IE 10, I suggest you take a look at it. It's uh, available uh, by default on both Windows Phone and Windows 8. And uh, you can actually upgrade on Windows 7 to version 10 of Internet Explorer as well now. So I do suggest you take a look at it because it is an amazing, amazing browser experience. And I'm not saying that lately. Yes, I work for Microsoft, so you can take that with a grain of salt. But I've talked with web developers that hate IE for various different reasons. And they all seem to think that IE 10 is actually something that's made Microsoft turn the corner as far as web standards. So, it makes web developers' jobs a lot easier because we are focused on making sure that the standards as they exist today and moving forward uh, are um, implemented properly within our browser. So this is really, really important. And here's some of the things that are, are, are great about IE10. So hardware acceleration. So one of the things that um, uh, is, is well, I wouldn't say is always a problem or is a problem per se, but JavaScript is an interpreted uh, scripting language, and as a result, it doesn't compile per se. That means that you know if it's interpreted, it is by nature or inherently slower than compiled language. So what we've done is we've added acceleration via the GPU, the graphic processor unit, to allow you to get uh, great ex uh, experience and great um, uh, performance for your JavaScript using GPU acceleration and things like that too. So that's something to keep in mind. It's also built for touch, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some of the slides later. But touch is now a first-class citizen within IE10, um, or has always been a first-class citizen in IE10, but is a first-class citizen now in, within Internet Explorer family of browsers. Whereas it used to be always keyboard and mouse uh, were first-class citizens, we've added to that with touch. So you can use your mouse and keyboard just fine. It's still the same sort of behavior that you would ex expect with IE10. Uh, uh, with, browse, uh, with the mouse and the keyboard, but we're also adding touch. And 
as we move forward, especially in mobile cases, so using your phone, for example, obviously you can imagine uh, touch is a very, very important event handle to, to manage, so, so keep that in mind. And it's fast even for apps and offline apps. So we do support the standard standards, so offline capability, plus you can hold state information within your uh, native wrapper code that you can then push to your JavaScript as well uh, when you fire up the, the browser. So regardless, it's, it's, it's fast, it's connected and non-connected experiences that you can implement as well. Uh, we've thought of these things because obviously to have a great mobile experience, you have to think about all these things as well. So we have support for those things to help you build the greatest experience possible for your application. It's a lot on this slide, and uh, we're frankly not going to go through any of the specifics of this slide, but you can see right now that you know the hardware accelerated platform that we have for IE10 is very, very, uh, you know, this is rich. And this is just some of it right here. The, the ones that are bolded are the ones that have either A, been updated or have been added new to, uh, to IE10 for, uh, for, for, for web standards sort of browsing. So, for example, IndexedDB was available in, in IE9. We've upgraded it as well for, um, excuse me, for, uh, for IE10. There's all sorts of CSS components that we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, that are uh, supported within IE10. Uh, these are all things that are making your life a lot easier if you're a web developer or a mobile developer that wants to use the web browser on uh, Windows Phone as a way to drive your application experiences. So, as I said, not going to get into this. This is just showing some of the things that we do support. So, let's talk about not just visually attractive apps, but like creating the right experience uh, through a user interface. So experience is more than just the UI. It's actually the flow of the application and everything. Um, but part of that, and a significant portion of this, is to make sure that you have the right, um, the right visual quality of your application to make sure that the user is you know, intrigued, that the user wants to come back to the application and things like that. And in fact, in the next session, uh, talking about uh, tips and tricks for succeeding on the Windows Phone Store, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I won't steal that thunder. But let's talk about some of the things that IE10 specifically, well, not just specifically on phone, but included on phone as well, uh, do support. So first thing we'll talk about is CSS3 effects. So you may remember from some of the demos that I showed you earlier around cascading style sheets in the previous session, uh, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with CSS3. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of things that you can do with CSS3 on not just the regular browser, but also on Windows Phone browser as well. So let's take a look. The first thing is two-dimensional and three-dimensional transforms. So if you remember me talking about context and things like that for, for, for the canvas element in the hypertext side in the previous uh, session, there was a context for two-dimensional and a context for three-dimensional. So you have the ability to create, you know, two-dimensional transformations, you know, algebra transformations, so that you know the image can be rotated or manipulated, or maybe it's not an image, maybe it's just a, an asset on the screen. You can absolutely do that. Likewise, from a three-dimensional standpoint, so if you have to do something that requires three-dimensional views and things, and, and say, for example, light sources, uh, you can absolutely make use of CSS3 to allow you to do that. So this is just out of the box within the IE10 browser. This is nothing that you have to implement within your phone. You just get this out of the box alongside of the other things that we're going to show you. Transitions are also very important. So I, when I talk to developers about transitions and animations within their applications, I, I have to temper their enthusiasm because there was a situation uh, in the past where, you know, you had the power to create any sort of animation you want to, and you can certainly do that here today as well. But you have to be judici judicious as to how you do that. The reason for that is you don't want animations to get in the way, right? The whole idea behind an animation is to make your application feel alive, but in subtle ways. So, you know, swooping in and out in, in a minuscule sort of way to sort of show that there is organic life to your application, if you want to call it that. And transitions are a component of that, right? So doing the right things around, you know, um, making, you know, fade in, fade out, for example, or just a very, very minute sort of movement of the page as you sort of select a button or whatever it is that you're trying to do. That is also available within CSS3. So you don't have to worry about building a lot of stuff in JavaScript. You can just hook up uh, transitional sort of elements within, uh, within your, your hypertext to CSS3, and that'll help uh, take care of a lot of it too. 
animations. So we talked a little bit about this as well. So CSS3 does support the animation si side of things as well. Uh, this is an example of the beta fish on Windows Phone 8, that uh, demo that you can see. So in fact, if you take a look at the URL that's underneath there, ie.microsoft.com slash test drive, and you can also just go to ietestdrive.com. It shows all sorts of HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, and SVG demos uh, that are standards-based. You can actually run these on your phone emulator or even your Windows Phone uh, device uh, if you want to see how they work. Um, and they work just great on IE 10, as you can imagine, which means that they work great on, on Windows Phone 8. And animations are a big, big component of this. So I talked a little bit about that in the transitional space, uh, previous bullet point, but uh, also full animation as well. So the fishbowl tank uh, example that they have here is a, is a good example of that. And then shadows. Um, this is a really horrible example, and I would suggest you never implement something as gaudy as this because it looks quite horrid. But the whole idea is um, you can create shadows that are not just standard shadows like the gray sort of shadowing for text and everything else like that, but it is something that you can provide. And it's not just about text shadowing. You can also provide shadows on boxes and things like that. Whereas this used to be something that was very, very difficult to do. Um, in, and you had to do either things with images or create an image on the fly, which is obviously something that requires a little computing power to do as well. Shadows around, around uh, screen assets on HTML5 are supported on IE10, which means that you can use those on Windows Phone 8 as well. So just keep that in mind. And then gradients. So again, gradients very, very important. We had that demo in the previous session on HTML5 around how you can create a gradient in, um, on the fly with JavaScript via the canvas. Uh, you can even do that in SVG graphics if you wanted to. But the, the bottom line here is that um, you have the ability to do that with CSS as well. And you can implement some great uh, visual ex experiences with that as well. And then finally, uh, custom fonts. One of the things that uh, we've seen in the past is it's very, very difficult to have the right experience in the past on browsers for your website because you sort of had to make guesses as to what kind of fonts would be installed on the, on the user's PC or the browser. So you were basically limited to either what fonts the user had or you created images of you know, titles. For example, as you can see, spice your type uh, here. Maybe that was an image instead of actual fonts because you didn't know if that user had that specific font on there. Well, you can use uh, the, the web open font format. I think it's called WOFF, W-O-F-F, uh, as part of your, uh, uh, your HTML page. And basically, it's, you know, it downloads the font with your web page, so you don't have to worry about having it on the actual uh, user's PC. Uh, or phone for that matter, and then you can have the right experience with the fonts that you want uh, based on that, that web page without having to do a lot. So again, just making things a lot easier for you to build the great experience that you're looking for in, in as lightweight a format as possible. All right, built for touch. So I talked a little bit about the fact that IE10 is touch first now. And if you have a, a Surface RT or a Surface Pro or even just a, another PC that's built for touch that has Windows 8, you're probably already familiar with this because of the fact that um, great experiences on the web, you know, you can actually use touch in right, the right way and, and do some interesting things with it. Well, we support that within Windows Phone as well, obviously. And we, there's no better example of where touch is so important than on a mobile device, because, uh, such as a smartphone, because you don't have a mouse. You don't have a keyboard, per se, in a lot of ways. Uh, so, so this is some of the things that you have to keep in mind. So let's talk a little bit about how we've implemented touch events. So the first thing that you need to understand is that we use the MS pointer model uh, which for, for touch events. Now, this technically is proprietary uh, as of right now, as of the recording of this session. Um, this is a proprietary sort of model that, that Microsoft has for implementing touch experiences in the browser. Um, that said, we've actually submitted the MS Pointer model to the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium that governs the standards for, for HTML5 and, and beyond, or all the standards for HTML for that matter. And it's in the process of getting ratified as a, as a model for touch. So we have the support of a good number of people, uh, including, uh, I, don't quote me on this, but I think Google's on board with the MS Pointer model, and Apple has some issues with it, or vice versa, one or the other. But we're working with everybody on the W3C to see if we can get this as a standard model. It might be renamed because I'm sure MS Pointer might not be 
something that Google or Apple might like to have in their uh, their, their standard. Maybe you never know. But the bottom line is uh, we're we're working to get this uh, this standard ratified, and it works very similar to uh, the the click event on on mouse uh, mouse events and things like that. Um, and that's by you know by design. That's something that we wanted to do. And as you can see right here, this sort of bit right here it follows a familiar pattern with the document object model mouse events. It also supports multiple touch points, which is obviously important, um, certainly on tablet form factors, maybe less so on, um, on for, uh, phone form factors. But if you want pinch and zoom, you would have two, uh, two, two uh, points of touch that you might want to deal with. Likewise, you might have a situation where you might have up to five fingers that you're making use of, although that would get kind of busy on a smartphone. But regardless, you have the ability to do that. And the good thing, as I said before, because of the fact that um, these events, the MS pointer events, are very familiar to mouse events in the DOM, um, there's probably a whole, not a whole lot of changes that you need to make to make your, your, your website, your existing website, uh, touch friendly as well, because uh, it doesn't require a whole lot of changes because of the fact that it uses the same model as the click event on uh, mouse events and everything else like that. So just be aware of that. Gestures. So gestures are obviously very important in smartphone uh, sort of uh, scenarios, as you can imagine. You know, the ability to uh, shake the phone or something like that. Um, you have the ability to, uh, uh, to, to capture gestures in the DOM. Um, maybe not shake, because that's an accelerometer generated thing. And so that would be communicated back and forth with your, uh, with your JavaScript. But the whole point here, a good example would be pan and pinch and inertia. So, if you're familiar with uh, pinch and zoom, for example, you know you, you you take two fingers and then you go like this to 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 zoom in or out, and it may be the case that you have a, a situation where you know you, you pinch in and then it sort of goes in, but it doesn't stop as soon as you leave your your finger your fingers leave the screen. It actually keeps on going down and then it eventually stops. That's what we call the inertia piece, right? Again, also if you slide up and down with your thumb. You know, you're sliding. It keeps on sliding until it sort of stops. It's like there's a force of, of friction that's making the screen stop in the in the process. So that is absolutely supported within the gesture events uh, model that we have within uh, within our, our model here. I'm not going to get too much into this, but it gives you access to the Windows Phone 8 touch language. Basically, what this means is that the idea of interacting with the user in a touch way. Uh, on Windows Phone in a native support uh, in a native way, uh, that's kind of what we're trying to get across as well with uh, with Windows Windows Phone uh, hybrid applications. So the HTML side of things, using the touch language that was native, and I, I use the lang language sort of loosely here. It's more of a, a way of doing things. That way of doing things is is available to you on on the web as well uh, for Windows Phone 8 and Windows 8 for that matter. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that. Immersive layout. So this is where it gets a little bit interesting. So if you think about content flow, something like this, where you have multiple columns, um, very, very attractive if you have like a newspaper or magazine type of application, or if you're trying to sort of mimic that idea. So you can have multiple columns within uh, Within within your web page, and CSS can actually manage how that content is actually set up with your columns and things. So you have the ability to do that if that's something you wanted to do. Um, used to be kind of difficult to do that, and you had to do some funky things to make it happen. No longer, that's actually something you can do. Likewise, uh, you might have uh, something called position floats. So position floats allow you to do interesting things around. Um, putting images, for example, in the middle of your text, and the text will wrap around that, even if you're in columns and things. This was very, very difficult to do prior to CSS3. Uh, and with CSS3 standard coming out, position floats are absolutely supported. And this is something that you can make use of within your, uh, within your phone applications as well. It just drives home a better experience, because you can create these rich user interfaces uh, that, that sort of flow naturally and everything else like that. So that's something you can keep, uh, keep in mind. Regions are interesting as well. So the ability to have text from you know, you know, different sources, for example, and then you can do pagination within each of those regions if you want to, uh, that use AJAX calls so that you're doing asynchronous calls so that it doesn't reload the entire page. It just reloads the region and things like that. 
that is something absolutely you can do uh, to support uh, uh, support some interesting things within your application as well. And this, for example, the screenshot that you see here where there's five different regions, that's just the way they've decided to, to put it up. Maybe you only have one region, maybe you have two regions, maybe you have 18 regions for whatever reason. But all these things are capable of being used within your, uh, your application. And then grids. So this is interesting. So those of you that are familiar with uh, grids on XAML, uh, so the Silverlight way of doing things, WPF or Windows Phone just in general, um, you're already fairly familiar with grids because grids are very, very useful for sort of aligning text, aligning assets on the screen so that it just looks professional. And, and it's a great way of aligning just everything on the screen and then it's responsive for, you know, depending on the screen size and everything. This was something that was very popular, and actually, we have we are working with the W3C to make grids a standard in CSS3 as well. So, uh, based on the popularity of the grid idea in XAML, we've actually provided some support and input into the grid idea for for CSS uh, that follow very very familiar ways to XAML within uh, your design. So, if you're if you're a XAML developer and you use grids before. CSS grids are actually very, very similar in a lot of ways. So they're very useful, great ways for uh, doing non-tabular sort of uh, uh, alignment and things. And it's something that you probably shouldn't be using tables anymore uh, to align information on the screen. So take a look at grids because they're very important. And then you have the ability to do some flex grids as well, flex boxes, so that you can actually do some you know, flexible content and things like that, which I won't get too, too much into. All right. So here we have a picture of the Microsoft.com screen. Um, this is taken actually in uh, IE 10, for example, um, on, the, uh, on, on Windows 8. So you see the full screen here. And in fact, if you take a look at, at this, this would be considered the layout viewport. So when I mean, what I mean by layout viewport is don't take into account browsers, just take account into the design of the application or, or of the web page. It doesn't care about you know the specifics of a device or anything else like that. This is basically the web designer saying, okay, this is the size of the the page, regardless of how big the device is and everything else like that. So this is the layout height, the layout width, and all those types of things. When you're talking about a phone, though, you don't get as much space in between those things, right? So there's a difference between the layout viewport and the visual viewport. The visual viewport is basically the device-specific idea around building uh, you know, what, what your experience will be on the web page based on the device that you have. And as you can see, layout and visual viewports are very different. In the case of a smartphone, for example, you have very little screen real estate that would be available to you on the layout uh, from the layout viewport side. So in this case, you have a situation where you're going to have to do a lot of scrolling back and forth, sideways, all those types of things in order to get all the information. So how do you deal with that within your web page? And that's something to keep in mind when you're actually building a web-based or hybrid-based application for Windows Phone 8 or for any other smartphone for that matter. So one of the things you should do is you know, set up a meta tag with the viewport. And this basically defines the initial size of layout, uh, the viewport in CSS pixels. pixels. So you can set up you know, various different viewport sizes and everything else like that for your application on the web. Uh, so that it supports certain standard widths and heights and things like that. So that's something you, keep, can be, you can keep in mind. And the other thing that you should keep in mind is don't actually use device width um, for, uh, for, for, your, um, for your CSS. The reason why is if you're querying for device width, you're actually trying to get into the specifics of the hardware that you're dealing with, that your user might be dealing with. The whole idea here is, you don't care about what device your user is using to access that page. The whole idea is that you as a designer want to make sure that the right experience for that page is appropriate for the device that the user is using it on. Yeah, I don't know if that made any sense, but the whole idea is smartphone, desktop computer, laptop, tablet, iOS device, Windows phone device, Android device, doesn't matter, right? The whole idea is create the greatest experience possible for that web page based on what the user wants to see. So in Windows Phone standpoint, the whole idea is to use uh, MS Viewport uh, to allow you to determine the, the size that the device is using and things like that. 
And this has a lot to do with responsive web design, which we're not really going to get into today. Uh, but the whole idea is that you can create these great experiences, and the web page will form itself visually to the right screen size and right, like the height and the width and everything else like that. So just keep that in mind. And then fixed elements. So one of the things that you may notice uh, is, I'll just show you this right here. This again is the screenshot that was taken in the Microsoft.com website. You'll notice on the left, or the right hand side, sorry, if you can see my mouse, basically right here, there's an element that's basically this blue box. And that blue box is always there, for example, right? So regardless of where you are within the application, uh, that blue box will always show up in that fixed position. So it's a few pixels down, a few pixels to the right, uh, to the left, for example. The whole idea behind that is, what if the user is looking at this part, right? So the surface part right here. How do you deal with fixed positions? Like they are relative to the layout of the viewport. So how would you actually make sure that you know? If you have fixed position elements within your application or within your web page, how does that react and how does that look within your phone application as well? So you have to keep that in mind because it may actually not be the right experience. So just keep that in mind. So with all this, there's a lot of richness as you probably saw in the previous session as well as some of the things that I just told you on Slideware here uh, now, that in a perfect world, all you'd need is HTML5 and then you'd be good to go. But the real world is a whole lot different than the perfect world in a lot of ways, as you can probably imagine. And there's a lot of things that, as good as HTML5 in the browser is, in the context of a mobile uh, experience, there's a lot of things that the browser just can't do, at least not today. So let's take a look at what we can do to make sure that you have a full experience for your application should you want to, uh, to, to provide more uh, functionality beyond what the browser can give you. And in this case, for Windows Phone, XAML comes to the rescue. So for example, if you want to do something in, um, in C Sharp that actually talks to the web page itself, you would use the invoke script uh, functionality. So as you can see right here uh, from C Sharp, and the example here is in C Sharp, but it's similar in Visual, Visual Basic. So the web browser is basically the control name for the web browser control that we're using in the XAML. And I'll show you an example of this when we show the demo. So you say web browser .invoke script, and then you say which script that you want to actually invoke from your C Sharp in the JavaScript itself with the arguments, right? So there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do here, for example. Uh, you can do all sorts of options. But the whole idea here is that, say, for example, there's something that you want to push some functionality or you want to invoke some functionality on the web page from your native wrapper, you can absolutely do that using the invoke script side. So this is something that we've included within the HTML5 template to help make it easier for you to build, build out these great experiences that make it seamless between the XAML and the, the web page so that the user doesn't even know they're using a hybrid application. But what about the other way around? So you have a JavaScript app that you want to push that information back to the native wrapper. Well, we support that as well. And this is, uh, uh, this is using the script notify technique. So basically what you would have is in the XAML where you define your web, web browser control, you would add a property to that XAML saying script notify equals and then whatever it is that you want to use as the name of your method or function that JavaScript will call when the script notify is done. And then in the JavaScript, in your script notify, you basically say Windows window.external.notify and then the parameters that you have associated with it. And then basically the script notify component within C Sharp, sorry, I m messed that up. So basically the, the script note, the browser uh, underscore script notify is the event handler within the C Sharp itself. So basically what would happen is the browser script notify ev event will basically grab the information that the JavaScript is sending to the native wrapper. And basically, this is an event handler. So anytime that the JavaScript will send information to the wrapper, the native wrapper, it will actually send that out over. But there's even more. So one of the things, that's all great from a, um, um, from a, uh, from a JavaScript standpoint. But there's also some cool things that you can do with the CSS and things. So for example, you can set the default background color. So one of the things that's really important within Windows Phone is that there's two different types of themes that you can have on your, um, on, on your phone. There's a dark theme, which is more often than not the, the theme that people use, but also there's a light theme, so where the background is white. Likewise, 
inside themes, you can have multiple different colors for your tiles. So in my case, I like the color orange and I use orange on my Windows phone for my tiles by default. You can actually have your browser page that is used in your native application pull Windows Phone to say what is the theme colors, both the, the light theme and the dark theme, as well as the tile colors that are used by the user so that it creates a more seamless experience. And you can absolutely do that as well. So let's take a look at some of those things a little bit later. But first, let's also take a look at um, navigation. So one of the things that's really important within Windows Phone is the back button. And more often than not, when somebody uh, fails certifications because they haven't implemented the back button uh, properly, uh, as, as easy as it is to, as a concept to figure out exactly how the back button works, sometimes it can get kind of difficult when you're talking about call stacks and everything. So one of the things that's kind of interesting with the web browser control is that it has its own state compared to the, uh, the, the native wrapper itself. So you can traverse various different web browser pages within your application, yet in the back, back, if you hit the back button, it may exit you out of that application because your application doesn't recognize the fact that you've gone to various different other web pages within there. So you can actually hook up events that, that allow you to do that. So there's the web browser dot can navigate back and can navigate forward methods that allow you to manage the control going forward and backwards within the web browser so that your call stack is consistent with what you, the experiences that you want for your application. So I do suggest you take a look at that if you're building a hybrid application as well, because it's something that's very important. And as you can imagine, uh, you can use or uh, local cache and cookies and clear them if you want to as well uh, within your native wrapper. As you can see right here, uh, you have uh, an asynchronous method uh, for clear cookies async and then clear internet cache async. So if that's something that you want to do, you can do that from your native wrapper as well. And finally, the last thing before, I think the next slide is basically a demo, but uh, the last thing that you can do is um, in the past when you were building a browser a hybrid application for Windows Phone, you would if you're having those pages local to your application, so they weren't existing on the internet, say for example you have an HTML page that you want locally on the phone, um, you would actually have to push that page to isolated storage and use that page there, which isn't necessarily a very difficult thing to do, but it can be a bit of a pain in the butt. So now what we've done is part of this template is that you can load files directly from the ZAP. And the ZAP is, uh, I don't know what it stands for, to be honest, but basically it's the application package that is, um, that is compiled or delivered to certification when you compile your application, right? So you compile your application, it actually creates this .zap file. Uh, that contains the manifest, contains uh, image assets, and now HTML pages, DLLs, and the code and stuff like that for your application. You can actually rename that .zap file to a .zip file to take a look what's inside. So um, the cool thing is, is now it makes it a lot easier for you to make use of local pages uh, within your application. And in fact, all the examples that I have uh, that I'm going to show you in a second uh, make use of local pages rather than actual pages on the internet. So as I thought, uh, the next uh, slide is a demo. So I'm going to show you a couple demos here about how you actually can build these great experiences within Windows Phone. So I'm going to exit this and can take a quick swig of water. All right, so the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this application. Actually, I've got it on debug right now, so I'll just stop it. So. I've just loaded this application just for the sake of being quick. Um, I'm going to show it to you first so you can actually see it. So basically what it is, is um, this is the same demo that uh, Lori showed you earlier with the calculator idea um, in, in a previous uh, developer movement um, uh, event. But I just wanted to show it to you because it actually shows you some, some interesting things that you can do. So it's just a standard calculator, and in fact, um, Everything but this column are basically loaded via jQuery mobile. Um, so they're, they're generated that way. And the reason why I mentioned this, and I'll show it to you in a bit, is that you can use mo like external libraries like jQuery or you know, Angular.js, whatever it is that you want to use to actually make, uh, make this happen to make a great experience. So what, you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 2 plus 3 equals the result is a prime number. Well, that's kind of interesting. OK, so let's take a look at this, how this actually works. So I'm going to stop the debugging. And I'm going to go to the main page at XAML first. And just 
just going to make this a little smaller so it's easier to see. So this is a XAML page right here. And literally, this page, this main page on XAML, that's what we were seeing before, is just a grid that has a phone browser control. And then we have an application bar, which really isn't important to this. So let's take a look. So we have a web browser control, which we've named browser. Then we have stretch and stretch for vertical and horizontal alignment, which means that it takes up the full viewport. And then on loaded, we have a browser loaded event that basically does something. And then we also have navigation failed. So just typical things like this. But if you remember from the slides, we have the script notify event. So the script notify event basically says, OK, when a script actually pushes something to me, me being the native component of the application, I want you to fire off the browser underscore script notify event. Now I could have named this Bob if I wanted to. It's not a big deal. So let's take a look at that script notify event in the C sharp code behind. So if I scroll down, there's a browser loaded, black back bar, blah, 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 and right here. So script notify, and then we have the object sender. OK, just a typical thing. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm saying the, the notify event args is basically where the JavaScript data that's being sent from the JavaScript to the C Sharp code is being sent. So basically, what I'm saying is that the value that was being sent to the JavaScript parse it into a 32-bit integer. And if it is a prime number, so these are all .NET or WinRT uh, mem um, uh, calls, right? So this is not, not JavaScript. This is C Sharp. So I'm saying the JavaScript brought me back a number or, or some data. I'm going to parse that into a 32-bit integer. And then I'm going to find out if that integer using C Sharp libraries is a prime number. And if it is, then pop up a message box saying the result is a prime number, which is what you saw. So that's pretty cool. So I actually took information from the JavaScript, pushed it over to the, um, to, to the C Sharp, and it actually acted on data from the JavaScript in my native wrapper. So that's kind of cool. So let's take a look at the actual JavaScript side of things. So script here. And I'm gonna, it's easier if I just go um, window dot. Uh, where is it here? So I'm just going to exit that. And if you take a look, the function equal press. So anytime I press the equal button, which is basically, I'll show you the HTML in a second, but it basically, the equal button is pressed and it hooks up to this function right here. So basically, I'm just you know doing some stuff here, nothing too special. So I'm getting the value. And then once I have the value, I'm going to use the window.external.notify, which was what I showed you in the slides before. And I'm going to grab the display value, and I'm going to push that to C Sharp. And literally, that's it. That's all I have to do to actually send that data over to, um, uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to the C Sharp code itself. And it's very, very easy to do that. Now, if you take a look at the index.html, which is where this calculator is, so we have right here just a div with some other operations and everything else like that. And here's the equal button. Okay. And I'm saying data value div. So basically, you hook this up to, and it's being hooked up via uh, JavaScript, so you don't have to worry about it. And it's basically saying the, the equal button, when you actually hit it, then you're good to go. Now, the one thing I did want to show you is in this HTML, this is a local HTML file. It's part of the actual project, as you can see right here. That doesn't mean you can't use external sources within your HTML. So in this case, we're using jQuery, uh, the, the minimized jQuery version. Uh, to actually deliver some extra functionality, which you saw in actually getting that information. So um, you can use hybrid applications, C Sharp and HTML. And likewise, you can use local HTML and external libraries. And uh, even you can use external web pages. So for example, say, for example, you wanted to host this calculator on the web, you could do this in Windows Azure websites, for example, where you can create some great, uh, great functionality on the web and host it there. Uh, and then that is pulled into your application that way as well. So that's the first example. Now, the second example I want to show you is this one right here. And I'm going to show you very, very quickly what this looks like. Just wait for it. OK. So I've got these tiles. I'll show you the code in a second, but it's just, I just want to show you. So this is actually interesting. So I can move this up and down if I want to. 
bring that back. Now take a look at this. So that's interesting. So depending on where I'm touching, well, in this case, the mouse, but you, if I had a touch screen, it, it would do this as well. The tile is sort of transforming. So I'm using transformations. And as I said before earlier, these are sort of CSS transformations that I'm showing you. So right away, you can tell that there's some interesting things I can do here. But here, I'll just make this a little like that. But as I also talked about the fact that themes are available. So this is a web page, and I'll show you there's no tricks to this. So I'm going to go to the settings first. There we go. Go to theme. Going to make this a light theme. And going to make this, just for the heck of it, I'll make it purple. That's kind of cool, kind of like my shirt. So I'm going to just back up just to make sure that it's can't completely there. Going to go to multitasking. So as you can see right here, this was the old screen. Now with me not doing anything, wait for it, boom. Kind of cool, right? So I've been able to sort of set the background according to the theme that I've chosen as a user for my phone and the tiles, because now the tiles that I've chosen, as you can see, are purple. Well, those tiles are purple too. So I've gotten all that information from the phone uh, themes themselves, and I've pulled that via the CSS, for example, to get that information in my web page itself. So that's all good. Let's take a look at what the code looks like. So again, main page .xaml. I'll Just show you that very, very quickly. Nothing too wild here. It's basically the web browser phone browser loaded. In this case, we don't have any sort of script notify because I'm not actually doing any specific communication uh, between the phone that I need to do as a third party developer. Um, the CSS stuff that I showed you where the theme change is actually built into the phone template, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, let's take a look at the actual HTML because I think this is where the rubber meets the road in this specific demo. So we have index.html. And so right here, we have some divs. So I've actually created a div class of tile, which I've defined. So I can actually add one more if I wanted to. So I can say div, um, oop, what happened there? Class equals tile equals tile. And just add this. Um, going to see if this will actually fit. It may not. So I'm just going to say JR rocks because he's in the room with me right over there. And he may find that kind of cool. So we'll just leave that like that. Now I'll try this again and run it. It may not show because the font size is pretty high, pretty tall. Yeah, so it actually did some weird stuff there. But you can sort of see, you can do some interesting things. There's the tile, so it's using the same sort of idea there if I want to. So I'm going to stop this so we can see. So that's all good. So let's actually take a look at the CSS that we've created for this. So basically, one of the things that you can tell here, so body, font family, Sego UI. So this is something that's included for, for Windows Phone, so you can make use of it. So, and also the viewport size is 480 pixels in this case. So we've actually defined that if we want to. Now here's the tile size. So def by default, I'm saying the color of the tile is white. So it's whatever, right? And then what I'm saying here is I'm saying that the background color is the highlight. So basically the highlight is what I've decided is my, uh, my actual color for my, uh, um, for my, uh, for, for my theme and things like that. And then also the image, the, the CSS transformation that you saw. So we have MS touch action pan Y. So I'm basically doing some interesting things around there. And then there's some extra things around the flex box and things for the tile. So nothing too, too wild there. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to go to the phone.js and hopefully I can find it. Um, where was it here? So what we're doing here is, in the transformation side, we're loading this .css, a transform, perspective 800 pixels, rotate 90 degrees. So we got a whole bunch of things that we're doing within the JavaScript as well, in this case, jQuery, that makes it easiest for us to do those transformations. So we have the ability to do that. And then we have binding the tiles to various different pointer, uh, MS pointer events or models. 
So this is again using the touch model. So what we say here is that we're binding it to the move, you know, we're moving a tile, pointer up, which is basically take your uh, take your, your your finger up, or MS pointer cancel, which will happen if, uh, say for example, there's a phone call that comes in that interrupts the user or something like that. And we're basically saying that anytime that we do something with MS pointer cancel, then we cancel the rotation, pointer move, then we calculate the transformation and everything else like that. So within the JavaScript, we're actually doing some interesting things to help with the CSS as well. And here's just some math that actually determines the, the transformation and everything else like that. So I'm not going to get into that. You can take a look at that later if you want. And that's basically it. There's not a whole lot more to it. It's kind of cool that you're able to, to create these sort of rich experiences that you know can be changed across, um, you know, used, I should say, within your HTML and, and everything else like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, and again, we can provide this code to you after the fact if you want. Now, I just have one more slide, which I'm going to go through very quickly because I think we're a little bit over time. Some other uh, HTML features, I'll just bring this out. There we go. Uh, I don't know why uh, Van Gogh's The Screaming, The Scream is uh, on there, but it's kind of cool, I guess. But the whole idea here is that there's other things that you can actually bring into your application that uh, we didn't show you here today in the demos, but are still very, very interesting and useful. So app cache, so the ability to cache state data and things like that, you can make use of that uh, within the browser. Index DB, so if you want a local DB within the browser, you can absolutely do that. Um, and that's a very, very important way of sort of you know, storing information and things like that in a structured way that allows you to get that information from JavaScript. Likewise, you can send via JavaScript that information to the local, uh, the, the, the native application if you wanted to. Uh, and then things such as history and web workers and all sorts of things like that. There's a lot, a lot of stuff that we've actually included. Uh, and I won't get into much more because of the fact that we are running out of time. But the whole idea here is, Hybrid applications may not feel, or at, at first glance, feel like it's it's a it's the same sort of richness of experience that you might have on Windows 8, which is a native HTML experience. But as you can see here, we've added a lot of goodness that makes hybrid applications really powerful. And you can build an experience, as you saw from those tiles, you know, you can build an experience that feels native to Windows Phone, and the user will never ever know the difference. So with that, we'll probably take a little bit of a break. And we'll get back uh, for the final session of the day before the Q&A component where we're going to, uh, but the final session of the day is going to be interesting. We're going to talk about tips for succeeding in the Windows Phone Store, which is actually not just about the Windows Phone Store, but also for building uh, great experiences that will pop on any sort of app store, whether it's Windows, whether it's Windows Phone, even iOS and Android and, and BlackBerry for that matter. So thank you for your time. Uh, we'll see you in uh, a few minutes, and then we'll take it from there. Rock on.